Luke chapter 4 is where we'll be this evening. Luke chapter 4. This is really the beginning of Jesus' uh, public ministry, this section of Scripture here. Um, this, is, this is Jesus starting out, and he's really beginning his road trip in a sense. And one of the very first places that he begins his public ministry, that he begins to minister to, is in Nazareth. It's his hometown. And he goes and he goes into the synagogue and he teaches. And at first he's received very well. They're impressed by his very gracious words. But then then he reveals himself to be Messiah to them. He, 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 he gives them even more of the truth, I suppose, than they wanted uh, to hear. And so these men... In the synagogue there, they they ran him out of the synagogue. They ran him through town. They ran him to the edge of a cliff. They were ready to do away with him. And it says there in verse 30 of chapter 4 that he passed through the midst of them and he went his way. So Jesus had a very sort of unwelcome homecoming there in Nazareth. And from Nazareth, he travels then to Capernaum. That's about a 30-mile venture. So I suppose if conditions were well and his spirits were high, he could have made it in one day. Perhaps he took two. I don't think that makes a whole lot of significance. But what we see here is that in verse 30, he is in Capernaum, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, verse 31 tells us. The week before, he was in Nazareth. Now, he's in Capernaum. And he's there, and and his friends and his followers are few. What we see, though, we get a very um, sort of a clear picture about who Jesus is in church, in this account right here. It's very interesting to see what happens. I suppose we should just dive right into it. Verse 31 says, He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. So Jesus, although he was a young man at this time, 30 years old, plus or minus a year, He was given the floor. He was given opportunity to speak and to teach there in the synagogue. And the wisdom, the authority, it says also, the authority with which he spoke blew their minds. His word, it says, his words was with authority. Don't get lost on that. Don't let that get lost on you. The word of God is powerful. I love this verse because when I was a brand new Christian, in fact, before I was a Christian, and I was just sort of flirting with church. Okay, I'll be honest. I was flirting in church. That's the only reason I went to church. Okay? But I found myself in church. And as we would study the Bible... I had stolen my dad's Bible because I didn't have one of my own. My dad, at the time, wasn't using his for whatever reason. I just went and snagged it. Some friends of mine, a couple of ladies, had invited me to church, and so I said, absolutely, I'll go. So I grabbed this Bible, I went to church, and we start reading. And we're reading the Bible, and I noticed that everything in red text was just blowing my mind. Everything in red. I mean, I mean, the black stuff was good too, but it was like the black stuff was the cake and the red stuff was the icing. You know what I mean? I mean, that was what little kids just go and dig their fingers in for. That's why I say, give me a corner slice, right? It was Jesus' 
specifically Jesus' words that captured me, captivated me, interested me. It was Jesus' words that would challenge me. You see, I wasn't akin to studying my Bible. I didn't really um, have a lot of interest in the Bible. Aside from the book of Jeremiah, uh, that stands to reason, although that's by God's providence, I would say. But it was those words in red, it was the things that Jesus said that kept me coming back for more. And so when I would study my Bible, I would just open up to the Gospels and I would just sit down and read everything in red print. And there's quite a lot of it. (laughs) But all of it, all of it was so beautiful to me. It was challenging. It was convicting. It was confusing, I'll be honest, some of it. But I couldn't let it go. As I look back on it, I think of, I think of the disciples and how they were listening to Jesus one day, the disciples and the crowds. And Jesus began to teach in parables, and he began explaining things, and there were so many who didn't understand, didn't believe, and just said, we're out of here. And he looked at his disciples and said, would you go too? And they said, well, where else are we going to go? Only you have the words of eternal life. And that's truly what it was to me, and that's what his words, that's what the word of God is. His word has authority. Now, authority, you can look at that word and you can pull a lot of different meanings out of it. Obviously, when we think of authority, we think of rank. We think of of superiority, absolutely. Another way to look at it, something with authority, you could say it has weight. Something with authority is, is heavy. If you think of it, this Bible, this book, it is the heaviest book on your shelf. Sometimes literally, if you've got one of those family Bibles, you know. But, but certainly spiritually, it's the heaviest book you can ever pick up. And yet children can wield it right? You're doing it right now. It's incredible, the Word of God. So, if you're ever at a loss for words, there's some pretty powerful, pretty heavy, high-ranking, authoritative words right here in your Bible. Always go to it. See what Jesus would have to say to you. His words had authority. And they were astonished at his teaching. It says in verse 33, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. A demon-possessed man in church. You never know who you're sitting next to, do you? (laughs) Now, isn't that interesting, though? There was nothing about the walls of this synagogue that kept this demon out of there. There was nothing about the lighting. There was nothing about uh, any sort of special decorations. There was nothing about the sign on the building that kept this demon out of this building. Here now, inside of the synagogue, there is a demon dwelling in, possessing this man, haunting this man. And what was it? What was it? that flushed him out? What was it that called him out? What was it that upset him? It was Jesus. It was the presence of Jesus, and obviously it was the word of Jesus. 
Now, I say that not to begin a rant, but simply to say that there are quite often many places, even churches, where a demon would feel comfortable to dwell. Because the Word of God is not taught. And because Jesus is not present. Plenty of people who gather calling themselves a church, plenty of people who gather professing themselves to be holy, professing themselves to be righteous, or professing themselves to have perfect knowledge or a truth, the truth, perhaps. And yet... The word of God is not there and the presence of Jesus is not there and therefore the enemy is there in that place. Notice the reaction. The reaction of this demon, this demon-possessed man who... This demon who used this man, the vessel of this man's body, to go into this synagogue to sit down to enjoy, <clears throat> excuse me, the service until Jesus begins to speak, and it is his authority, the authority of his word, that causes this demon to cry out with a loud voice, "Leave us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth?" The demon knows Jesus. Does that mean the demon is saved? Now, that's kind of a funny question, but let's think about that. Do you know Jesus? Oh, okay, calm down. I'm not getting heavy on you. But you see, there are a lot of people, just as we were saying before, we were talking before about how there are a lot of places, a lot of churches, the Spirit of God is not there, Jesus is not there. The word of God is not taught. It, is not, it does not have authority there. It's not given place for authority there. Therefore, the enemy is comfortable to dwell there. And yet there are many people who also would profess to know Jesus. But is simply knowing Jesus enough. That's the picture that we see here. In fact, James, James tells us, oh, the demons, they all know Jesus. Of course they know Jesus. He says, they know Jesus, but they don't, they don't follow Jesus. They don't submit to Jesus. He says, James puts it beautifully, he says, they tremble. They recognize his authority. And yet knowing that they have rejected his authority, his lordship over, over their existence causes them to tremble. They recognize they are they're out. And yet, as I was saying, there are so many who would profess to know Jesus. And yet Jesus is not Lord of their lives. They've not submitted their lives to Jesus. They've not given over the lordship of their lives to Jesus Christ. Oh, logically it makes sense. Logically it makes sense to them there is a God. Logically it makes sense to them that he had a son. Logically it makes sense to them that Jesus Christ had to die for mankind. Logically they would love to follow and to to believe in Jesus, I should say, to believe in Jesus and to get out of jail free. But when it comes to the lordship of their lives, the direction of their lives, they have yet to turn that over to Jesus. Now, before you beat yourself up and question your own salvation, remember what Paul said. Paul, in writing to the Romans, he talks about this idea. And he says, You know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, 
I, I, that's what I end up doing. And then Paul, in complete humility and honesty, cries, O oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? Jesus. Just because you're fighting a battle, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. It doesn't mean that you don't have Jesus. It doesn't mean that, lo- that Jesus isn't the Lord of your life. The problem is when there's no battle to fight. The problem is when there's no conviction in your life. The problem is when there's no question over your actions. Is this Right? Is this wrong? You see, that's when I'm concerned. When somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Now, don't get me wrong. I do my best to meet them and to handle them you know, graciously and lovingly. But in my mind, I'm smiling because this is a person who wants Jesus. This is a person that Jesus wants. So the demon recognizes Jesus, knows Jesus, and says, what have we to do with you? And then says, did you come here to destroy us? You see, they know their time is coming. Our enemy knows he's licked, but not yet. And therein lies the rub. And so this demon says, is it time? Have you come to destroy us? And then, then it says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. We spoke of Jesus' authority, how his word carries authority, how it carries weight, how it carries rank, because of who he is. The demon said, the Holy One of God. The incredible thing is that this authority, this power, is available to all of us. Jesus, in charging his disciples later on, he's going to send them out. He equips them. He gives them the enabling. He he blesses them with the power to cast out demons, to heal, to do miracles, and then he sends them out, he says, as sheep amongst the wolves. Isn't that sort of an interesting contrast right there? They've got all the power available to them through the Holy Spirit, And yet, he says, you're like sheep amongst the wolves. I might say, well, those are some powerful sheep, right? (laughs) No. No, the point is, is that they're still but sheep. Because the power, the authority, does not come from them. It comes from him. And that's important to remember. That's important to remember because not only do we fight a battle or a conflict internally, with our flesh, with what I want to do and what I don't want to do. But we also, the Bible says, we fight a battle spiritually. Ephesians tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. A lot of the difficulties and the opposition and the persecution that we come up against in life as Christians, is because of the spiritual battle, battlefield that we live our lives in. 
Now, that's not to say everything that doesn't go your way is the devil's doing. Sometimes tires get flat. If there's nails on the road, a tire is going to pop. That's just physics. <laughs> okay? But at the same time, there are certainly moments, there are certainly times in life where there is something evil in the midst. There's something evil going on. And when you encounter that time, when you encounter that opportunity, remember whose authority you have. It's not of your own, but it's of the Lord. Therefore, use his word. Lean upon him, call upon him for power. So the demon it came out of him. It said it, it throws the man into their midst and it comes out of him. It does, did not hurt him. Verse 36 and then they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves, saying, what word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. There's something incredible about a church, a fellowship of people, who give place, who give authority to the word of God. There's something incredible about a fellowship, a church, a family of people where the presence of Jesus is real that causes the world around to take notice, that causes people to speak, that causes word to get out. You can't contain it. Try as you might, but you can't contain the word of God. You can't contain the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. And so, report goes out to all the surrounding region. Verse 38, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he leaves the synagogue there in Capernaum, and he goes to Simon's house. Now, this is Simon, who would later be renamed Peter, who at some times in the New Testament would be referred to as Cephas. One guy, three names. I typically say don't trust a guy like that. But <laughs> uh, one guy, three names. So this is Peter. He goes to Peter's house, Simon's house. Now, a uh, neat thing is, archaeology shows us, it can show us where the synagogue in Caesarea, or excuse me, in Capernaum was at that time. And Simon's house is believed to be only a few houses down, a stone's throw away from the synagogue there. So, uh, just sort of a neat thing to picture Jesus with people amazed, people in awe, walking out of the synagogue and then heading down the street, probably with Simon, and perhaps Simon's wife, down the street to Simon's house. It's time for Sunday brunch, time for Sunday lunch or dinner, whatever your family's tradition is on a Sunday afternoon, Saturday to them. So they head down to Simon's house. And when he gets there, it turns out, turns out his mother-in-law has got a fever, high fever. Now, interesting thing about this is that an incredible thing just happened there at church. And then they get home, and guess what? Something's wrong. We just had a great time at church. 
Did you hear that message? Did you hear the word that went out? Wasn't it powerful? Did you see what he did to that demon? What a testimony. Did you see how everybody was just leaving and they were just happy and and they were just excited and they were just in awe and then we go home and stuff is just wrong. She's sick suddenly. She's got a fever. This may be a little tongue-in-cheek, but let's be honest. Sometimes, even after a great, great day at church, uh, we can go home and suddenly someone gets a hot head. Isn't that funny how that can happen? We just had a great time. We just, we just had a great moment with the Lord, with the Word, with the fellowship of other believers in prayer and in worship, and then we go home and, and suddenly somebody blows their top. No coincidence. No coincidence. But you see, this here, this very scenario, the problems back at home, This is a perfect opportunity for us to see how how Jesus comes home with us. Jesus doesn't stay in the sanctuary. (laughs) It's not like he's the last guy in here. See ya. Have a good week. I'm going to sleep over here. No, 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 no. Remember, where does he live? Where does his spirit choose to dwell now? Within our own hearts, right? They go home, and there's problems at home. Family problems. In-law problems. That never happens, right? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> No, but there's, a, there's an actual problem here. There's an actual issue here, a health issue here. No coincidence that this is happening right after an incredible thing happens in synagogue there at church. Verse 39, So he, that is Jesus, stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Jesus Now, anyone who's been through some Sunday school knows that Jesus can rebuke the winds, right? Yeah. And we just saw that he can rebuke the demons, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Even the waves, right? Um, A fever? But... The intellectual might say, you see, a fever is not a thing. A fever is the result. It's the body's reaction to all of this and that. It's the immune system kicking in. It's doing this. The fever is not like some little, you know, demon, some little phantom that just lives inside of you. Don't let your mind, (laughs) your imagination, I should say, interpret this verse for you, okay? Uh, The purpose, the point of the verse here is that Jesus heals her. Now, to Luke, who was a doctor, mind you, writing this account of this gospel, trying in his medical mind (laughs) to figure out how a fever can go away like that when it's high, high, high. To him, uh, yeah, it it must have just, just Jesus rebuked the fever. Simple as that. And truly he did. He 
He heals her. He heals her. Now, the important thing that we got to take from those two verses together, 39 and 38, is that we leave church, we come home, there's problems, and suddenly we're blowing our tops. No, 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 no. No, the point is, you take what you saw in church, you take what you experienced in church, you take what you learned in church, and you bring Jesus home with you, and you apply it to your life at home. You apply it to the problems at home. You apply it to the problems in your family. You apply it to the problems with your loved ones. But how do I rebuke a fever? You pray for that person with Jesus' name and in his authority. Will they be healed? That's up to the Lord. But it doesn't mean that you can't try. It doesn't mean that you should allow that thing to, to overshadow, to distract you from what God is doing in your life. You know, a lot of times we talk about what God's doing here in this church. And the reason that we say that is because when we all gather together and, and we begin to share each other's lives and we begin to, to talk with each other and fellowship with each other and we begin to hear testimonies from each other and we see what you guys are doing, then yes, we can see what God is doing in this church. But don't think for a moment that that is stuff that happens only here in this building or on this property. No, it's you guys living your lives out there, taking what you learn here and applying it to your homes down there. It's a beautiful and a healthy thing, and that's the picture that we see here. Take Jesus home with you, and what you learn at church, apply it in your home. What do we learn at church? Well, we certainly we learn the Word of God. So do you use the Word of God at home? Start to. Well, certainly we pray. God knows we could all pray more. Certainly we give Jesus place. We give him priority. Remember, Jesus is a guest here in Peter's house. There's problems, so it says, they made request of him concerning her. Well, when you get home and there are problems, who do you make your requests to? To Jesus. Even if it's a simple thing to us, like a fever. Fever is no big deal to us. Why? Because we have so many pills. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can get, I mean, you can do... Uh, just, I mean, there's a wealth of knowledge. Herbal stuff all the way to your hardcore, you know, chemical-based, doctor, mad scientist-created stuff, you know? We have so many options. We are living in the most medically advanced society on the face of the earth in the history of the universe. Fever is not a big deal to us. So when we go home and we encounter a problem, even if it's a small one like a fever, give that to the Lord. Give that to Jesus. Give your child the Tylenol and pray for them. Right? It's a simple principle. Um, by the way, I don't want you to feel like I'm coming down on you guys. This is stuff I had to learn too earlier. <laughs> It's a great picture. Now, here's, here's the really beautiful thing, okay? So we, we saw this principle, right? Bring Jesus home, give him place, give him priority, make request of him, let him handle the problems that will be waiting for you at home. There are plenty of problems waiting for you at home tonight. Let him handle those things. Ask him into those situations. Let him do his work. The end of verse 39, this is powerful. Immediately she arose, she arose and served them. 
She is healed. She serves Jesus. You see a picture there? You see that, how that works? Jesus works in your life. You work for him. (laughs) Not because you have to, because you get to. It's not a responsibility. It's a response. That's what she does. Jesus didn't say, now that you have been cleansed, now that you have been made whole, now that you are at a normal temperature. (laughs) Now that you've done this, now that I've done this for you, you must do something for me. He doesn't say that. It's her response. It's her response to his working in her life that causes her to serve. It's not because the, the leader of the synagogue called her up and asked her to do this thing. It's not because Peter twisted her arm into it. It's not even because Jesus asked her to. It was her response to Jesus working in her life. Service. It's the natural response. If you're serving out of responsibility, we don't want you to serve. If you're serving out of response, we want to help you to serve. If you need a little motivation, <laughs> I'd be more than happy to motivate you. Because sometimes we want to serve, but we don't know how. Right? I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes we want to serve, but we don't know how. I don't know what I'm good at, God. I don't know what I can do. I don't really know how I'm gifted. To be honest, God, I would just rather go home. <laughs> more comfortable just with me. (laughs) There's a lot of people there in the the serving thing. You know, that's the opportunity. Those are those times where you have the opportunity to go to another Christian, to go to a, 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 a brother or sister in the Lord, go to a pastor or to an elder, Go to a a ministry leader. You know, whatever's going on that you just think is the bee's knees. Or maybe you see a need. Maybe you see a need. Can I bum you out for a second? It's not a coincidence you saw that need. (laughs) It's not a coincidence. How many ministries start because somebody saw a need? This church wouldn't be here had not many men and women saw, seen the need. Had seen the need? Had seen the need. And sometimes, though, we we see the need. We see how badly it's needed. And so we go to someone. We, We need this. Do this. Well, chances are you're probably asking someone who's doing something else already. And that's okay. That's okay. First of all, take that need to the Lord. See what he wants to do with that. And second of all, consider, pray, whether this is a need that you should be filling. Some people get frustrated when they come to me and they say, I I think we should do this. And I say, that's a really good idea. Would you like to do that? (laughs) And they get offended sometimes. And I am sorry if I've ever offended you for doing that. But I'm going to be honest with you. This is how it works. She is healed. And she realizes... um, It's after church, they're hungry, and they're standing over me in my bed. I'll tell you what, Jesus, Simon, go sit down, boys. Let me go get you some lunch. (laughs) She begins to serve. Simple as that. So, the natural response. 
not because of responsibility. Verse 40, Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the demons came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving. This turns into a long night for Jesus. He taught in synagogue, which, by the way, if anyone here has ever been a little bit, <clears throat> had a little bit of issue with a 45 or 50 minute sermon, synagogue could be four to six hours, okay? <laughs> so calm down. <laughs> And don't worry, I'm not going to keep you that long tonight. He had a long day at synagogue. He comes home. Guess what? There's problems at home. They begin to serve. He begins to serve. He begins to do things at home. Suddenly, there's a lot of service happening at home now. This woman just woke up from a fever. She was healed. Now she serves. Simon doesn't say what he's doing here the whole time, but it's his house. I imagine he's taking care of things, right? There's probably a lot of needs, especially when the whole town shows up at sundown <laughs> with every single sick and tired and maimed and disabled person at his house. You ever have that guest that just wouldn't leave? <laughs> Honey, can you help me with this in the kitchen real quick? We are never inviting them over here again. <laughs> Isn't there an etiquette about how long you should stay if you're a guest? I don't know. No, I'm kidding. So this is a long night. When the sun was setting, they had all those who were sick, various diseases, brought them to him. And he laid hands on them, on every one of them, and healed them. There are times when Jesus leaves the crowd. We see that in his life in the Gospels. There are times where Jesus has to go. And we'll get there actually here in just a couple of verses. But you see, Jesus recognized, Jesus, I should say, of course he recognized, but I should say that Jesus is making a picture here of what's necessary, what's needful. These people needed him. They needed him. And so he's going to be there for them. Every one of them. There's nobody who is too sick for Jesus. Nobody. I had a friend of mine in Bible college, a very dear friend of mine. He told me a very sad story about his younger sister who was burned very badly playing with fire. And so she was deformed over her entire body. And her mom heard about this preacher who was filling up stadiums and healing people. And how the Holy Spirit was causing all kinds of beautiful chaos in these meetings. So she bought a ticket to go see this healer with her daughter in this stadium. 
My friend went with them. And there was special seating for people. And he said, when we walked up to the ushers and they saw my sister, they sat us so far back and away, it would have taken my sister an hour to get down to that stage to be touched and healed by that man. Broke his heart, broke his mom's heart. If her, if his sister's poor heart wasn't scorched over by that point, it was then. But Jesus, Jesus has time for everyone. Jesus gives priority to everyone, no matter what, no matter what. Jesus has time for you. So he heals them all, casts out demons, rebuking them. He tries to get away. It's daytime. The sun is rising now. The sun's rising. It's daytime. He starts to take off. He says, I just need to go out into the wilderness for a little bit, to a deserted place. I just need to go. You know what? I'm just going to go take a walk. Um, I'm just going to go take a walk up off in the mountains there, off the hills. I'm going to go find a back way to go up to Butte, something like that. Jesus goes, tries to get away. But the crowd sought him came to him, tried to keep him from leaving, verse 43. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee, the whole region there. So he moves on from there and begins to do a circuit in the different synagogues all throughout the region. But the point is, is that, you know, Jesus, he took time for what was really necessary right there. And he says that he healed them, every one of them that came to him. He healed, he worked, he moved, he touched their lives, he gave them time. Obviously, they don't want him to go. <laughs> this is an entire town with an incredible amount of gratitude and love now for Jesus. Great, Jesus says. Now it's time for the word to go out. Now it's time for the message to go out. It's the same picture repeated from what happened in the synagogue. Did you catch that? Incredible things happen in the synagogue. Demon is cast out in the synagogue. And his word is spoken in the synagogue. His presence is powerful there in the synagogue. And what happens? It says the report went out from all, for all around. Now... He goes to this house, and this is a public, a, a much more public setting now. The entire town is out there. Everyone with somebody sick is out there. He's doing more healing. His presence there is powerful. And Jesus says, now it's time for the word to get out. He says, I have to go preach to the other cities also. This is how it's supposed to go. Word is supposed to travel. You can't contain Jesus. You can't. They tried, right? <laughs> they tried nailing him to a cross. This will stop him. <laughs> they tried throwing him in a hole and rolling a stone over it. That'll keep him. You can't contain Jesus. So, I hope that was an encouragement to you this evening. Um, be honest, I wasn't really sure um, whether or not I was supposed to go tonight, whether I was supposed to do this tonight. I was kind of waiting for the word from the man, but the thing, the way it goes with funerals and things like that is that, you know, 
sometimes he can't always break away, and that's fine. So, um, so that was just a place that I had been in recently in devotions. I hope that was a blessing to you. It certainly was to me. Um, take Jesus home. Take Jesus home. What we do in church, let us do at home. The way we work and worship and serve and love and study, let us do that at home. And when we, when, we, when we do it at home, let us do it in the authority of Jesus Christ, with his word, by his authority, by his power. Not because we're special, not because we learned some great lesson, not because we can find an eloquent way to put it. Let's do it in his power. Let's serve our families Let's serve those around us and remember the people that you meet throughout your day, throughout the rest of your life, there will be, there's no one who is too sick for Jesus.